Tonight, two thoughts clean up and cry out as we look at a nation. If you're not paying attention, I think it'd be good if you did. God's doing some pretty amazing things in our country right now. <clears throat> Obviously, we have an enemy who's angry about it. Every time righteousness raises its head, wickedness shouts a little louder. If you find wickedness quietly walking the streets, it's because righteousness is being subdued. And uh, one of the reasons there's all the turmoil right now is Satan is the producer of strife and discord and war and, and all of that craziness because uh, somebody's lifting up the Bible and somebody's lifting up God. And I think churches across the land are working at it. And I don't believe I'm not a doomsdayer that it's all lost cause. Let's go uh, build a bunker under our house and crawl in it and eat till our food and water's gone and then die. I think I'm excited about tomorrow. I'm excited about what God's going to do in our country. And I believe that revival and uh, wonderful victories are available to every generation. God is not a respecter of persons. And I've read too much Bible. And here you have Manasseh, a horrible king, and Israel's a mess. And Ammon, or Ace, uh, Ammon, his son, a horrible king, and Israel's a mess. And here this kid, Josiah, is born. Eight years old, he takes the throne. He's got a heart for God. A kid with a heart for God can change the world. Just a kid. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be some scholar because God doesn't need your brains. God needs your heart. So a teenager who gives his heart to God is just as important as any pastor who gives his heart to God. God just wants some people to love him. And God is looking for a vessel and he'll use any old vessel he can. Judges chapter 3 in your Bible, and we're going to read several verses. If you wouldn't mind having your phone off, that would be good. And uh, Judges chapter 3, and I'm going to read verse after verse. We're going to skip through the book of Judges, and I want to point out several things that God said, one thing that God says over and over and over. So let's stand together, and if you're not familiar with this book of Judges, I'll explain it later, but the summary is the, the people of God got backslidden. And so they got in trouble, and then they cried out to God, and God sent them help. And then they got proud and lazy, and they got in trouble. And then they cried out to God, and God sent them help. And it happens over and over. Judges chapter 3 and verse 9. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel. Isn't that great? When we cry, he raised up the deliverer. Chapter 3, verse 15. What happened between verse 9 and verse 15? They got backslidden again. Verse 15, but when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud. This is a left-handed guy. This is a fun story, you kids, if you haven't read it. He's the one who takes a knife, pokes it into the bad guy's get, gut, and the, he's so fat, it sucks the knife in and the dirt gushes out. Great story. Good bedtime story for kids. So twice we read, they cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer. Chapter 4, look over chapter 4, verse 3. What happened between the Ehud and here? They got backslidden. God delivered them. Things got easy. They got backslidden. And so they were under persecution and trouble. Chapter 4, verse 3. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron. And 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And if you read on, the Lord raised up Barak and Deborah and delivered them. Chapter 6, what happens between Barak and Deborah and chapter 6? They got comfortable, they got lazy, they sat around watching TV too much, and they quit going to Sunday school and running their bus routes, and, and uh, God brought pressure and burdens on the country. And in chapter 6, verse 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 6, and Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, and then the next few verses it says, the Lord called Gideon, and Gideon delivered them. Chapter 10, and there's others, but I'll just read this one more. Chapter 10. <coughs> and we'll stay here if you'll save this. We're going to look at several verses in chapter 10. Don't turn from here. Chapter 10, verse 10. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and this is different this time, saying, we have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. And they realized how they'd forsaken God. 
and they cried to God, hold your place, we're going to read some more there. Father, bless us as we look at your book and help me to be on target. And I pray your Holy Spirit would speak to hearts and that we tonight would understand how much it means to you and we call out to you for help. I pray there would be people tomorrow morning driving to work who would lift up their heart in prayer that you would deliver our land. That there would be teenagers who were getting things together for their day and they would stop and they'd pray for their country and pray for mercy from God. Father, we ask that throughout this week we'd be reminded often that we need you. This country needs you. Every fire should be a reminder we need you. We couldn't stop a fire. All the firemen in the world couldn't stop a fire blown by the winds of an almighty God. We need you. We couldn't prevent an earthquake. We couldn't prevent a hurricane or a tornado. But you can. And I pray you draw us near to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Keep your Bibles open there to Judges chapter 10. It's a sad story in Judges 10. If you want to go back in the back to Joshua. Joshua leads the children of Israel around Jericho and God brings a great victory. And they come into the city, into the land of Israel and they go to this city and that city and they win victory after victory after victory. Of course they messed up at Ai and they messed up with the Gibeonites. They made a covenant they should not have made. But God blessed them and God, understand this, you don't have to walk perfect to be blessed because we're all going to mess up. But you got to keep seeking God and you got to keep acknowledging you're wrong. Uh, start acting like you're not wrong and the person, uh, the other person's wrong. That's a pretty dumb way to live. Confession and forsaking, those two things are wonderful things to find blessing and victory in your life. And uh, so they got through and uh, they, they basically subdued the land, but there were pockets of enemy everywhere. And by the way, that is a picture of your life when you get saved. God will help you and God gives you the eternal victory. Your name's in, written in the book of life and and you've got his power and his blessing to beat any enemy, but there's still an enemy out there. And it might be something creeping into your marriage or in your child's life or in your relationships or your personal life with laziness or pride, whatever it might be. And, and they looked at the land of Canaan, this promised land that was theirs. And God, Joshua was old, and he said, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. You've got to decide what you're going to do. I'm old. God's taking care of me. Everything's fine. God's given us his victory. Now you've got to decide what you're going to do. And Joshua died. And uh, the, the 12 tribes had to make decisions what they're going to do. And, and they met together and said, well, this one will go in first. And, and they got a little victory. And then they faced some conflict. And they said, well, it's hard. So they, they let the enemy stay. Could have been that enemy of pride or could have been the enemy of bitterness. Could have been the, the enemy of, of um, lust or passions. And so they, they had control, but that, that enemy was still there. Another one of the tribes of Israel started to take their land. And, and they, 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 well, these people had chariots of iron. It's hard to beat those people. And, and, and I, just, I just can't do it, God. And the sad statement, if you read through the book of Judges, it says, when they got strong enough, they could beat them, they didn't. That's a tragic story. You're a young Christian, you're just starting to get some victory, and sure, you got some things you haven't beat yet, but when you get strong enough to beat it, beat it. Keep pushing and keep driving out the enemy. You got your drugs and liquor gone, well, now you're going to have to worry about getting your finances right. You get your finances right, you're going to have to get your attitude right, get your anger right. You have to keep pushing that enemy out. You can't stop pushing until you're pushing up daisies. I should write that down. That's a great statement. But they get to Judges 10. All over, if you read Judges from beginning to end, you, it's, understand it's regional. It's not nationwide. Be in Essachar and Zebulun and Judah and Benjamin. And, and that's why there's, it's, it's small areas. And they had a defeat. And then they brought in a judge. And they had a defeat here. And they brought in a judge. And so God would give leaders. When the people of God humbled themselves, God brought leaders. And these are political leaders as well as spiritual leaders. I don't think that God can't put the right person in the White House or the governor's mansion. 
When Brother uh, Everson was here, he mentioned that in the last election, there were more people voted for President Trump in California than voted for Jerry Brown in the governor election. There are enough intelligent people. We could vote a conservative into the governor if we could get somebody intelligent to run for governor. In California, I'm not sure. We might have to import somebody from Portugal or somewhere. I don't know what we're going to do here in California and elect some preacher and then mess his life up. But they would call out to God and find some victory. And then they'd get lazy. And then troubles would come. Then they'd cry out to God. And he'd deliver them. And then they'd get lazy and complacent. And then trouble would come. And it went back and forth and back and forth. And that's where we are in chapter 10, where we stopped reading just a minute. Follow along with me in Judges 10 and verse 10. The children of Israel cried to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee both because we've forsaken our God and also serve Balaam. Now, every time before when they cried to God, God sent a deliverer. This is the tenth time. Ballparking. Might have been the 12th time. Over and over it happens. Look on a little bit further. Look at God's response in verse 11. And the Lord said to the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines and the Zidonians also and the Amalekites? Hey, God remembers every victory he gave us. God knows what he's done for us. God knows what he's helped you through. God knows the times I've been, been overwhelmed and God carried me through or carried me over. God knows that. And God wants me to remember it. Don't forget how good he's been to us. And God's reminding him. Verse 12, the Zidonians and the Amalekites and the Mayanites did oppress you. You cried to me and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet you've forsaken me and served other gods Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. Go, cry to your gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. That is a scary hour. Can I just say this? America doesn't want to get where God says, you can have it. You want your materialism? Have it. You want your big screen TVs? Have it. You want your stadiums with 90,000 people watching a ball game? Take it. See how that'll help your marriage. You want your fancy cars and your big houses? Take them. You know, I think we had better homes when we had one and two bedroom houses and kids slept on the living room floor. Whether people like it or not, before the civil rights movement in America, there was an even unemployment rate between black and white Americans. Before the civil rights movement, there was an even divorce rate in black and white America. It's all this fussing and fighting that got me better than you and you better than me and I deserve what I'm not putting blame on anybody. I'm telling you, when we start fighting among ourselves and vaunting ourselves and arguing over things, that's what messed this country up. That happened to be the same time we threw the Bible and prayer out of our schools. Happened to be the same time we brought rock and roll into America. Happened to be the same time we got Dr. Spock. And don't spank your children. All of that happened in that 50s, 60s era. That was a horrible, tragic time in America. What a mess we've made of this country. We need to understand that the last thing we want is for God to say, go on. You kids think your video games the best thing that ever happened? Try fixing your marriage with one. When your kids got cancer up at the hospital, Cry out to your, whatever your video game is you're playing this week. Hey, Call of Duty won't help when your child's been hit by a car. And the casino's not going to give you comfort at your spouse's funeral. God says, look, you've chased after this stuff. He says to the Israelite people, go on. You think all your money's going to solve your problems? Have it. God said, I'm not going to help you. I am done. We don't want to get there in America. We may have been there and in mercy. Look at the story. I love this story. This is, this is how good God is and how bad people are. God said, I'm done with you. I'm done. Go ahead. 
Verse 15, And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We've sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good to thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee this day. They, didn't, they, didn't, they just said, we're bad. We're, we're wrong. We're wrong. You know what's great? They didn't say, we'll never do it again. <laughs> they just said, look, we, we did wrong. Is there any mercy left? I love the passage that said he is ever merciful. And his mercies are new every morning. Isn't God wonderful? He is so good. Verse 16 they didn't get any answer. God didn't raise up a judge. But in verse 16, they put away the strange gods from among them. And they served the Lord. He, they were not delivered, but they served him anyway. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. What a, what a great story. They cried out to God. He said, I'm done with you. I delivered you here and here and here and here and here. Go serve your gods. I'm done. They said, God, we're, we're wrong. We admit it. We're wrong. Help us. And they put away all the strange gods, and they began to serve God in their bondage. They began to serve God in their misery. They began to serve God in their suffering. And God's up in heaven and thinking, oh, these guys. All right. What a God we serve. What a God. Right after I started the church, someone gave me a book called The Laws of the Harvest. And the verse, if you, what you sow, you'll reap. And it is a biblical principle. In this book, it says every sin you've ever sinned, you will reap the harvest of it in your life. And they go on and on and on. I thought, what a depressing book. I thought, if I reaped every sin, if I reaped the harvest of every sin I've ever sinned, I'd be dead. I'd be miserable the rest of my life. I, would, I mean, we'd all be drugged through a gutter. You know, we'd be half buried and eaten by roaches and... And he, it, we would live horror movies. What a merciful, merciful God. God's soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. In verse 16, verse 17, the children of Ammon gathered together. And they encamped at Gilgal, and the children of Israel encamped themselves, assembled themselves together and encamped at Mizpah. And the people and the princes of Gilead said one to another, what man is he that will, that will fight against the children of Ammon? He'll be head over everybody. They said, we just need a leader. You know what? Every nation needs a leader. If you've not had enough sense to pray for your president, you need to get some more sense. By the way, I prayed for President Obama faithfully because God commands us to in 1 Timothy 2. But boy, I pray with a smile on my face for President Trump. <laughs> he's a knothead. He's, he's such a goof. But you know what? He just says what he thinks, which is so refreshing. I remember the big debate a few years ago. It's a holiday tree. You idiot! It's been a Christmas tree for ever since America started. It's a Christmas tree. You're dumb as a rock. I don't care what college degree you've got. You're stupid. This crowd of people saying America doesn't have Christian roots. They're stupid. They're stupid. I'm not saying we're good Christians, but we've got Christian roots. You can't deny it unless you're an idiot. Slept on one side too long. All your brains fell out. And it's a Christmas tree. Go down the street. You ever see a holiday tree lot? They don't make holiday tree lots. It's a Christmas tree. And you can't have Christmas without C-H-R-I-S-T Christ. I don't care if you don't believe in Christmas trees, but they're still there. And you can't have one without Jesus. Stupid world we're in. What a mess. God was angry. God was angry. Hold your place. We'll come back to it. A man named Jephthah comes along. And Jephthah is one of the most sad and encouraging stories in the whole Bible. And one of the hardest stories to understand. So I'm not even going to preach about him. Sometimes people come to me and say, Pastor, I've been studying this verse, and I just can't figure it. And I can almost always tell them it's Hebrews chapter 6. <laughs> anyway, there's three or four. I don't know either. Just read it and go on. Who cares? <laughs> Guess what? I don't know everything, and neither do you. So let's just enjoy what, we, what I do know is awful good. And um, let me tell you, there's hope. There's hope. Because God's a God of hope. 
there is a need for us to focus on crying out to God. And there's a need for us to repent. To turn from our wicked ways. First, before you close your Bible, because we're going to look at some more verses there, let me give you six or eight or 25 quick things about cleaning up. Uh, if you don't get my marriage moments, I'd encourage you, if you're married, to get them. Sign up for them on our website. If you have a problem doing it, call the church office. Cuss the lady that answers the phone. Tell her I can't figure out your website. Don't cuss her. Don't do that. <laughs> but um, Mike Johnson, one of my friends, pastor up in Northern California, said, I've been trying to hook up to your blogs or tweets or whatever it is you do, and I can't figure it out. And I said, well, I'll have one of my secretaries do it. They work especially with technically challenged people. <laughs> and uh, But uh, this each Saturday... I send something out on marriage each weekday, just something on the Bible. But um, this Saturday, I talked a little bit about peace in your home. Number one, it's time to clean up the way we treat our spouse. I got started on it this morning. I had to stop. But I'm amazed at the, the Christian homes where there's ugly words between husband and wife. You need to, get, you need to make your salvation straight. And you say, well, I know I'm saved, but I'm married to someone I doubt about. Um, you need to start treating your spouse like Jesus wants you to treat him. The Bible says for you, us husbands to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And there ought to be such a respect and such patience and such kindness in our marriage. There ought to be, uh, there's expectations we have but we ought to have an expectation. What do I expect me to do to be a good husband? Not what I expect my wife to be to be a good wife. That's her business, not my business. My language, my attitude, my treatment of my spouse. I'm not going to go any further on it, but if you expect God to reach down out of heaven and help our country, we've got to throw out these false gods of our arrogance, of our vulgarity, of our anger, of our, of our meanness, of our disrespect, I don't want my kids to ever hear me speak disrespectful of their mother. Number two, it's time to clean up the godlessness in our home. Just go through, go through your video collection. Go through the things you watch on TV or on your tablet or on your computers. Go through it and clean it up. We've, we've, we haven't had one for a couple of years, but often in the summer we'll have July be a no TV month. Say, why July? Because there's not any good sports going on in July, and I know I couldn't get a man to give up his TV in January. <laughs> They're just not any good enough Christians to do that. Just think through the books in your home. How about the social life? Is, is God in all your home? We've been here 35 years. We've never been to Pechanga. I've only been to Las Vegas to preach. I've never eaten in Las Vegas. Some of our college boys going to Bible college, um, they stopped in Las Vegas because they heard how good the breakfast buffets are. They drove through the night, got to Las Vegas, and while they're in getting this great buffet, someone stole their truck with, is Pat McPat Cook's truck, with all the stuff in it. Everything. Our, Bible, our boys just showed up at Bible college in shorts and flip-flops. You know why? They went to Las Vegas. <laughs> Had they eaten in, at McDonald's in Henderson, they'd have gone to college with their clothes. I don't know why that happened, but it, it, it did happen in Las Vegas. Our, 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 our social, we need to clean up our social life. We need to clean up what we listen to, clean up the music in our home, clean up the TV in our home. I think we need to clean up our financial robbery of God. Look at your budget. It's the end of the year. If you give with a giving number, like most of us do, <clears throat> I'm my, I've got an envelope here in the pulpit, and it's just the blank ones like in the pew in front of you, but, except these have Gideons on them. I'm not supposed to have any Gideons. Our Gideons is paid off. Amen. Put a smiley face next to Gideon. Ain't paying that. I wrote, I scratched Gideon out this morning and I put building fund because I still want a new building up. But if you have a giving number somewhere in January, you're going to get a statement in the mail showing how much that, Gideon, that giving number gave this year. Take your 10, whatever that number you get from the employer, your W-2, 
and how much you made this year and hold it next to your giving and ask if it's godly. To say, God, are you pleased with my giving? Well, I don't use a giving number. Probably because you're afraid. I don't know. It's between you and God. But I know this, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. I'm amazed the people that don't have enough money to give to God that buy booze. People that don't have enough money to give to God buy cigarettes. I mean, what's a cigarette pack of cigarette cost? I don't know. No one, no one knows, right? You're not, you're not stupid. You're not going to admit it. Four, five, six dollars a pack for cigarettes? And we don't have enough money to give to God? Every, I, I tease Karen Giovanelli every Thursday. I show up at Golden State, and they'll, they want to have something there for me. They say, what do you drink at Starbucks? I said, nothing. I said, whatever they have, it ain't worth what they're, they're charging. And they said, what do you drink at home? What kind of coffee? I said, I don't drink coffee. I'm saved. And uh, I, get, I get my caffeine with bubbles. And uh, so uh, I drink tea. And he said, well, I'll bring you green tea. So every Thursday morning I get there, and there's green tea, big old tall green tea in double cup because it's so hot. And, um, and then he'll have a, he has, I never heard of this before, but he has a, a, a sick tea he drinks. And he brought me one this week. It's really good. It's lemon and honey and mint. And um, I, I like it. But I'm still not going to go spend five bucks on a cup of tea. They just don't make any tea worth four or five dollars a cup. They don't make it. I'm not going to. Look, we got to get our finance in order. I don't think it's wrong to you, for you to go to Starbucks three times a day. But this better measure up. Check out your giving to missions compared to your giving to a queer, loving, anti-American Starbucks. You figure it out. Now, you spend your money wherever you want. Uh, most every industry in America is a mess in one way or another. But I'm not going to be robbing God when I'm wanting him to bless my country. This thing right here, <coughs> this, that thing right there is the God robbing us of the true God. You wait till you have a very serious surgery. That heart surgery I had two years ago, the, the hospital bill came in a couple months after my heart surgery, 94 or 90, I think it was $94,000. That was the hospital and doctor bills. Suddenly what you do with this matters. Because I don't have the money to pay the doctor bill anyway, but I do have the money to pay this. How can I say, oh, God, bless my country? And God says, you rob me every week. You put more money into lotto tickets than you do the church. You put more money into your Coca-Cola than you do the church. You smoke more money than you do the church. I think we need to keep clean up our complacency toward the world with our children. Just ask yourself, what is it that you let, how much of this world do you let get into your kids' lives? Now, by the way, I think boys need to work. I think they need to be exposed to the world. My, my sons have always worked out once they hit 10, 12, 14 years old. I had them mowing lawns. I had them out. If I could find a place for them to work for a Christian person, Wes Morgan back here, he had Josh <coughs> working with him when he was young. I don't know how young, but I know Wes took him to the movies. First time my son ever went to the theater, Wes took him. <laughs> they were tearing one down. And uh, thank the Lord for that. Tear them all down. And, uh, but I think, I think our boys need to learn to work and to face things. But, but Josh never got a book in his hand, but that I didn't read it first and block out any bad words that were in it. But I think there's too much good in Louis Lamore to not have a boy read Louis Lamore books. And just, just black out the bad words. If you want them reading girly Hallmark Channel books, go ahead. You'll raise a femme for a boy. I'm not against Hallmark Channel if you're a girl, but I can't watch it. I'll sit there be, to be a good husband, but I'm not going to sit there to enjoy the look. If you enjoy Hallmark, Hallmark Channel, you must be a woman. <clears throat> I'm not against it. I just can't do it very much. I can only do it because we kiss during the commercials. Um, 
How much this world do you let get into your kids' hearts? You're, you're the parent. You've got to decide. But ask yourself, God, I want you to bless America. And he says, what do you do with your boy? What do you do with your girl? Just because you don't have, you know, some people don't have TV, but the books are so uncensored, you just will have TV. Our complacency toward the world, our Bibleless living. It's time to clean up a home that the Bible's not read. How much is the Bible read in your family? The kids read it. Does mom read it? Does dad read it? How do we expect God to bless the country when we ignore the, the eter eternal word of God? How can we ask God's blessing? Or oh, the perversion, the number of Christian men looking at pornography. Or doing wrong things. You know, we don't need to look at politic, politicians to find evil. We can look at preachers and Christian men across this country. Our thoughts of impurity, our actions that follow, and the, the wickedness that creeps in. I believe Jesus is the answer, but you know what? You're not going to get close to Jesus without repentance. I believe that God could reach down to heaven and heal a home and heal a nation. I heard, I heard a, a preacher today say, just cry out to God. And I'm thinking, yeah, cry out in repentance. Because I don't care how much you plead for God's mercy. If you don't turn from sin, he's not listening. God's word constantly, the very word sanctifier, the word holy, is turning from wrong unto God. Now, during the day, I might ten times turn back to my wrong, catch myself, turn back to God. God's all right with that. He doesn't like it, but he likes it. I keep turning to him. But when we're over here enjoying our sins, saying, oh, God, help my country, God's saying, you help your country. Second Chronicles 7.14, by turning from your wicked ways. Right here, and again, don't, we're going to come right back to it in just a moment here, but God told Israel, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. I'm not going to answer your prayers. And they said we, they put aside their false gods. They put away all that. They turned to God to serve God. You cannot serve God without turning from wrong. And if you're trying to play both sides, it's like having two wives or two girlfriends. It's going to end ugly. Look there, if you would, at J Judges chapter 10, <coughs> verse 15. Judges 10 and verse 15. The children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou to us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee this day. In verse 16, And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved. God's soul was grieved when they, number one, turned from sin, and number two, served him. Both. We need to be, there's some positive that needs to go on here, not just negative. Let me give you four quick negatives. It's a time we cry out to God. It's time we pray for our leaders. I want my children and grandchildren to have a country. I pray for our governor. I pray for these elections that are coming up this next year. I pray. You hear me pray in here. It's on my mind all the time. I want God to show wicked. I want him to put the spotlight on wickedness. I want God to reveal shame and wrong and evil and I want America to realize that's not what we are I want God to raise up good people you read our, Amer our nation's history they weren't all Bible believing Bible reading people but they all had a love for God and a respect for God and a respect for the Bible even Thomas Jefferson who rewrote it he'd be reading his Bible thing well I don't like that part he, he wrote his own Bible I saw online the Jefferson Bible. I'm picturing I'm getting the Bible Thomas Jefferson had with his notes or something. No, it was Thomas Jefferson with the parts he didn't like cut out. But at least it wasn't Thomas Jefferson's Koran. He liked the Bible. He just, he was a heathen. You know, I don't know if he's saved. It's none of my business whether he was saved or not. I know he's a great man. I know we wouldn't have this country without brilliant minds like his, but there were some godly men. There were some great people built our country, and I don't care if it's a Benjamin Franklin who said right out he was not a Christian, but he'd go hear the preaching of the gospel, and he, he was doing a scientific experiment. How far can I get? And he said he could hear George Whitfield's voice a mile away. Figure that out. He didn't get the gospel, but he got the scientific part. Those people all respected what we are. We need to pray for our leaders. I think we ought to start praying for our homes. 
I think there's not enough honest, bowed head, God help our family. Just, just be honest. When's the last time you called out your family members' names in prayer? As, was you men, you can grumble about your wife. When's the last time you prayed for her? Every day. Every day you ought. I mean, the single guys, they're praying for a wife. No, it's the married guys who ought to be praying for their wife. And, and a wife can complain about her husband. When she prayed for him, God bless him and guide him and give him wisdom and give him insight. Help him at his job and help him with his commute. And God, help him. How do we expect, why do we expect God to come out of heaven and do some miraculous thing for our country when we don't take, and I'm not talking about the whole country, I'm talking about us in this room. Some of you teenagers couldn't remember the last time you prayed for your parents. What kind of Christian are you? Not pray for your parents. We ought to pray for our homes. Pray for mercy on our homes. We ought to pray for our leaders nationally. We ought to pray for our homes. Secondly, number three, we ought to pray for our schools. Not just the one our kids go to. You drive through town, you drive by a school, pray for that school. Thousands and thousands and thousands of teenagers. I'm just guessing that in Elsinore alone, there's over 10,000 teenagers, maybe 20,000 teenagers. Has anyone ever prayed? You go by Elsinore High, how could we not say God bless them? I remember the, going to the, <coughs> excuse me, Elsinore High, Kathy Bailey was over there. I'd go over there at lunchtime with my guitar and, her and, and uh, sometimes Steve Rowe and Justin Soto and others would be there and meet with these teenagers during lunch. Who's pray- do you know this group of young people, 30, 40, what do you think we have for the Josh Bus teens? About 50 teenagers that come without their parents. They're going to be at school in the morning. Has anybody prayed for their schools? I have a new lady that came this morning, second time she was here. She's taught from kindergarten all the way up to college, taught all kinds, taught special ed to classes and things. It sure be good if somebody knew her name and prayed for her when she was teaching kids. Well, I pray for our schools. I think we ought to pray for our church. I think we ought to pray for our church's safety in this culture we're in. I mean, physical, violent safety. I think we ought to care. Um, I don't think we need everybody in the, in the church to carry a gun. Um, if everybody in the church carried a gun and a bad guy came in, he'd probably live and the rest of us would die. <laughs> no joke. <clears throat> out of Christmas Tree Lane, I was out with a bunch of our guys. There were probably 20 of us uh, just shooting steel targets and clay pigeons. And this bird flew in. That was a dumb thing to do. <clears throat> Little sparrow. I don't know how many shots were fired, and the bird just went boop, 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 and flitter off. A bunch of guns going off in here, we'd kill everybody but the bad guy. <clears throat> I'm for your Second Amendment rights. <clears throat> but I think if you're going to carry a gun, you ought to go to professional training at least once a year. <clears throat> you got no business carrying a firearm if you're not good at it. That's, uh, that's the boss talking here, all right? You ought to pray for, our, for safety. But, but we ought to pray. We ought to pray for our Sunday school kids. And these kids that came in this morning, a couple of hundred young people rode those buses and scattered through that building up there. I, I come in, and as the buses are pulling out in the morning, and I start seeing walking down here, as the kids are coming up, and I look at those kids. Those kids love church. You ever just pray for them? By the way, you bus captains and bus workers, have you ever thought about picking up some key kids and bringing them back to church Sunday night? Some pretty good kids that get something out of church, especially the teenagers. Some of them don't bring back. <laughs> Pray for God's blessing on our churches. And I'm just being very candid. No church in this community is our enemy. Pray for the other churches. If you think a church even vaguely preaches the gospel, pray for them. I drive by churches. I was going down toward Murrieta, and there's a church over there on the left, whatever its name is. I remember when the new pastor took over, they changed the name, and he sent me a letter. He said, I just want you to know to change the name and kind of restarted here. We had some problems. I have no idea. He said, you probably know what the issues we've had. I love that I don't know the gossip. <clears throat> I have no idea, but I pray for them. I drive by that church and pray, God, help them preach the gospel and, and help them to make a difference. Now, we may not get together with our youth groups because then we'd have a problem. But I can sure pray for them. I think we ought to pray for the churches in our country because it's God's people who will bring revival to God's nation. 
the hope of this nation is cleaning up and then praying and begging God for his help. We have a great God. There's nothing outside the reach of God. The problem is us. That's a problem. We need, you know what we need? We need bus drivers. You know, most of the people who drive our buses, or not most, probably half the people who drive our buses have three or four other jobs already in our church. They don't need to be driving a bus. Some of you come here all the time and you could drive a bus. You need to be driving the bus. And not, not picking on you, I'm just telling you, we've got, we've got people with four different jobs and they're trying to be everywhere. Um, we, if everybody picked up a little of the slack, we sure get a lot more done. What should we do? Pray for your leaders. Pray for mercy on your homes. Pray for mercy on our schools and our community. And pray for God's blessing on our church. We serve a great God. If God could conquer death and hell, he could conquer wickedness in this land. And we want God's blessing. Let's pray. Father, help us today. Help the teenagers in this room to realize their prayers mattered and that their personal lives matter. Help the children here realize that their desire to do right matters to their God. May we as husbands and wives in this room repent and turn from the wrong that has crept into our homes, into our personal lives, things at work, things along the road as we travel. May we be careful and clean up things and may we work hard at rearing children for you. <coughs> we ask for help, Lord, that we'd remember to pray for mercy. That story that you brought Jephthah along and you delivered Israel. You told Israel you were done with them, but your heart was moved by their suffering and you brought up another leader. One more time you gave them deliverance. We ask for help for our nation, for our state, for our community. Bless us, we pray, Father. As wickedness would raise its ugly head more and more, as right lifts it up itself, we pray that you'd deliver us and protect us. Bless our families. Bless the long hours these men work this week. Help them and protect them as they drive and as they work. And protect our homes and bless our nation, we pray, Father. Protect those that are doing right and trying to push for right and and give us new leaders this next year. Give us some more good leaders. Bless our state. Pull our state more and more to the right, we pray. And may our church make a difference for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.